So welcome to this session. Uh, apologies for the delay in uh, starting it. Um, we're delighted to have you uh, here today. Uh, I'll introduce everyone in a minute, but uh, just want to kind of give you a brief overview of what we do uh, here at the Compact. So my name is Marie Morris. I'm the head of sustainable finance at the UN Global Compact. Uh, today's session is going to be about diving into the role, the specific role of uh, CFOs and uh, what they can do in terms of post-COVID recovery specifically. So we're going to be covering those those areas. And uh, the, the Compact actually launched a CFO task force back in December 2019 that's uh, been uh, sort of supported by more than 25 companies, of which... Uh, SNAM and uh, others are, are part of and joining us today. So we're looking forward to uh, to having this conversation. And and of course, you know, if you're interested to kind of join us, uh, please you know, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to kind of continue growing the, the task force. Uh, we really see the role, the specific roles of CFOs at, as bridging uh, between you know the capital markets and direct investments. And that's why you know for us, it's uh, fundamental to. Uh, continue the, the, the sort of dialogue between investors and uh, CFOs. Um, and this is a great, great pleasure to introduce uh, some of our speakers today and hopefully we'll be joined uh, by a few others um, in a minute. Uh, Maria, welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Apologies for the delay and uh, for the have technical problem. issues. Um, I have so very problem. Briefly, problem. That's great. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce everyone and then we can uh, we can get started. Uh, so Scott Matter uh, is one of our co-chairs and will be uh, moderating the session today. He is the CIO at Pinko. Uh, Fiona Reynolds, I'm sure most of you will already know, uh, is the CEO uh, at TRI and a great expert in all uh, investors of related topics. Alessandro Pessini is the CFO of SNAM, and I'll, I'll let you as well, uh, uh, Alessandro, say a little bit more about yourself. And Maria Carrasco is also joining us as the CFO, uh, one of our CFOs from the task force, working for FCC Constructions. We're waiting for uh, our other co-chair, uh, Mr. Depali, who's experiencing some technical issues. So I suggest that perhaps we kick start, and then uh, you know, as soon as he's online, I will make myself scarce because we might uh, just in terms of bandwidth you know, so ensuring that everyone has a chance to speak but uh, welcome to the session and feel free to post questions on the wall as well thank you okay thank you marie um i, I thought maybe just to start off with we uh sort of frame uh the situation or kind of describe how i see it uh, but I, i'm anxious to hear um your thoughts on uh, what you think this crisis means for uh, businesses um, in terms of the dynamic of, of moving towards action on sustainability and moving towards the 2030 uh, agenda. I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, this is really a, a crisis has created a sort of unique environment and that there's a tremendous uh, willingness in society, uh, you see it in government and in business, to revisit um, economic models, to revisit business models. And there's a tremendous flexibility to uh, do extraordinary things with monetary policy and with fiscal policy that wasn't there before. And virtually we're seeing before our eyes really unthinkable things happening. And many of them are very, very positive with respect to sustainability, this sort of questioning the, the, the economic models and priorities. And I would say, from my perspective, you see many, many um, fiscal authorities and many members of society and the business community moving towards this concept of you know, stop thinking about things, you know, can we afford to do these things and start positioning it and looking at these are things that maybe can't afford not to do. So we have to invest for the future with sustainability in mind. And and there's a lot of good things happening there with respect to when you look at the fiscal spending priorities, not only the numbers large, but many of the fiscal plans that are being put forth, for instance, the actions in the EU, we see it uh, happening at the, at the state and local level here in the US, they're really directed towards uh, really in a more sustainable direction, addressing healthcare needs, addressing the climate crisis, uh, green investment, etc. And we also see other uh, very uh, interesting things happening, uh, things that, that uh, probably wouldn't be happening at the pace they were in terms of financial innovation. Uh, we've seen a, a huge growth in the bond market um, in general, but especially with 
instruments that are connected to sustainability. We've seen a big growth in social bonds, for instance, and COVID-19 response bonds. And usually they're set up with uh, complete alignment and reporting um, in terms of the SDG. So that's really a great uh, development. So the backdrop, uh, for me anyways, is looking at really a, a whole new uh, way of looking at growth and looking at investing. And that's what's really uh, one of the big benefits uh, about this particular crisis. And, you know, it's often said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And uh, it's because it gives us more opportunities to think about things in a new way and to hit the reset button. And I definitely see that happening out there. So I would, uh, you know, I'd very much like to hear um, your thoughts on how you see uh, businesses responding in particular. Um, and maybe Maria, we can start, start with you. Thank you, Scott. Um, first of all, thank you to, to let, let me participate again in one panel of views. Uh, this item that I think is very interesting for everyone. And maybe because of the crisis, I I will want to say something that maybe uh, I think it's interesting to everyone. Uh, I think we could uh, win this battle, and of course, with a positive attitude, um, our companies and ourselves, uh, we are ready to 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 innovate and to uh, overcome again a crisis. I think we are an expert, uh, all of us, our companies, the employees, the director of our organizations, because. It's not the first crisis that we are going to overcome, and um, I think we are ready. So, an attitude, a positive attitude, I think is going to help us uh, for everything. About your question, Scott, um, I think the European initiatives could be applied, and of course, European business and our organization is committed to make the Green Deal a success. Uh, to reach the climate uh, neutrality, and I think by around the mid-century, and of course. Uh, as I said before, uh, we are determined to apply uh, a huge transformative investment by both in public and private sectors. According to the European Commission, around 260 billion uh, euros, I think, yes, the annual investments will be needed by 20 and 2030 to achieve the, the current climate uh, energy goals. There is in, or there are in, in, in the market a variety of sustainable uh, finance products. I think it's too wide. Uh, there are, I don't know, uh, first of all, we have to, to check the ratings and, and also the research, the scenarios, analysis of the risk with a lot of items and happy KPIs. And of course, there are a lot of products like loans, bonds, funds, but I think we are not so clear uh, to these investors that they have a lot of money around of the market. And maybe we have to teach them about the products. And of course, we have to be uh, more clear uh, to clarify, or maybe to, under to standardize and to take levels of that products to teach them where they have to invest. Um, it can be difficult for some clients, for example, the, in particular, the retail in investors, uh, to understand the different degrees of climate, environmental, and social ambition and compare the specific piece of each product um, I don't know maybe it's also uh, something very uh, common in another sector or in other products that we have to take something like um, a standardized costly and complete verification and reporting process to have is to have an official standard to which certain uh, financial of course incentives uh, may be attached so I think we have to to help them, to help the investors, that I'm sure that there are a lot of money in the market, uh, and they have to know where, how, and why they have to invest the money. No, thank you. I, I definitely appreciate those comments. I it's one of the one of the reasons that we've been so supportive of using the SDGs as a unifying concept because the complexities can get very difficult. But when you start uh, framing things in terms of the SDGs, then uh, then you know our end investors can understand it, and it makes it easier for issuers too to really focus in on the key topics for their business uh, with respect to what they're doing addressing sustainability. And it's different by industry, but the unifying concepts and themes of always speaking the sort of the the global language of sustainability, which is, is the SDGs, is really, really helpful. Alessandra, do you have comments? 
Thank you, Scott, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Yes, I think that uh, indeed what has happened has forced all of us to look at things with different glasses and different perspective. Uh, and, and this leads me to think that this is a crisis that will, it's unique, it's very different from any other crisis we had before, but it's not going to be, to be wasted. I think that uh, in, in big crises, all the personal, corporate, national, global level focus are very painful at the beginning, but this disruption uh, effectively will help us to focus on what is essential and refocus our effort going forward. And I think that this is really what is happening uh, thanks to COVID, or unfortunately thanks to COVID, I should say, uh, because ultimately, at least what I see in my companies, this is a, a clearly accelerating our agenda towards 2030 and 2050. Um, and, and I also think that this crisis has pushed us in a massive way a um, few years forward on technology. I think it's really impressive to see on one side, look, be, always looking at numbers, how Zoom market cap today is, is equal to the sum of all seven biggest airlines globally. It was kind of shocking uh, if you think about it. But at the same time, it speaks to the companies that have uh, invested through the years in technology, digital, digitalization, innovation, remote also of critical assets, and we run an energy infrastructure company. So for us, being able to provide services with continuity, despite what was going on, being in Italy, which was at the center of the pandemic after China, uh, was a, a very tough uh, challenge that we faced with success thanks to the focus that in the past to all of this. Within the broader ESG agenda, and I pick up the, what you were saying earlier, referring to the importance of SDGs, I think that what has happened has not only pushed all of us to focus more and with a different strength to environment, but also on social. And the social, what we do, the activities we carry out, and the implications of actions on this, Great on our people. I think that the, the there is a economic downturn will will ultimately growing uh, inequalities, and we will all be called with a different approach to address it. Um, I think that the last point I wanted to make in terms of what are we crisis is that clearly. Europe will have a chance to show its uh, climate leadership and the push that the EU is giving on the green in, new Green Deal. It's a, it's a great opportunity on one side for people uh, that operate with greater emphasis on what we are doing, but at the same time, this is a lever to support the region. something that uh, will promote uh, our investments but at the same time will hopefully help in the about amount of resource unheard of. And so I think the great challenge is to make sure that we invest and deploy those resources in a wise manner, because that is what will allow to come out of this crisis with the right other to Thank you. Um, I think, um, Fiona, you, you sit in probably the perfect seat to see what um, investors globally are doing differently and thinking about in the COVID or hopefully getting close to post-COVID era. Maybe I'll turn it over to you for your reflection. Sure. So, look, um, first of all, I, I suppose, I, I'm, uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see so many people online, and I hope everyone's safe and well. I think, you know, I'm obviously in furious agreement with all of the things that have been said. And thinking about, you know, the what action can we build on for the 2030 agenda, I really think that 
Um, as has already been alluded to, what we're seeing at the really coming together to strongly call for a green stimulus and for bailout packages that aren't condition free. You know, we're seeing the we're seeing governments already put conditions in place, whether that's the French government with Air France and changes about what they have to do around biofuel. Canadian government uh, saying that if you're taking government loans, you need to report in line with the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. You need to be allowing um, collective bargaining, etc. So when I step back from this and I think about it, it's really clear to me that a lot has been learnt since the 2008 global financial crisis in how you should handle a crisis. And yes, 2008 was a financial crisis and this is a health crisis that's become an economic crisis. But I think we've seen a far more human-centred response. The bailout hasn't been all a feeling about how do we bail out major financial institutions at the expense of individuals. Uh, it's been much more, as I said, human-centred. And so from the investor point of view, I have never seen our signatory base. We've got 3,000 signatories. They represent 100 trillion in assets under management US. And I have never seen them so engaged on any issues. And the social issues that Alexandra referred to, they have always been what I've always called the generally the poor cousin in the E, the S and the G. But investors have very much wanted to understand what companies are doing with their workforces from an employment point of view and also from a safe wanting to understand about what's happening to suppliers and what's happening in supply chains and saying to businesses that yes you need to deal with the crisis to keep an eye on the long term and on the long term sustainability issues so what i see is that what we're having from this crisis is a real focus on sustainability, which is interesting because when it first happened, I had lots of people from the media and people from lots of organisations who sort of said, well, surely your whole agenda is going to be um, turned on its head at the moment. You know, no one's going to want to talk about climate change. No one's going to work, talk about, want to talk about ESG issues. But far from that, we're seeing that we are you know, having this great response and sustainability is coming to the fore. So I think one of the lessons that we have to take into the sustainability agenda though has to be, if we think about the climate agenda, then look, when we look at what's happening at the moment, I keep thinking, well, look at what can happen when governments see a threat and they act globally and they act with force and they act with urgency. And we need to see that happen in the same way with some of the other threats that we face, whether that's climate or whether that's the growing inequality or um, the social upheaval that we're seeing going on at the moment. I think that investors have also been very much with business leading their, uh, lending their voice and making sure that they are talking about the fact that coming out of the crisis, it's not just about building back better, sorry, it's not just about going back to normal, that we want to build back better and that investors with business have been standing up and saying we want to see a sustainable and inclusive and green recovery, that we want to see a recovery that prioritises human relief and job creation and doesn't lock in uh, high carbon pathways. So I think it's just been really great to see how much sustainability is playing a role in in this response and that there isn't this sort of, um, uh, you know, I live in the UK, when the global financial crisis happened, what happened was that there was austerity measures brought in and they were significant. And we're only just coming out of the end of that, or, or a lot of people are, and that exacerbated inequality. and. Um, this and the social cohesion within the population. And so I'm really pleased to see that we're dealing with it differently. I mean, I know we've got a long way to go and there's going to be a lot of difficult times for a lot of people, but I think the whole, the whole vibe about what we're doing is very different. And I think that's going to set us up well for the future.
I definitely, uh, definitely agree with those those comments. I think it's um, something about the, um, the the way that this crisis has taught people that um, you know, we're more interconnected, more vulnerable, perhaps than many people realized, and so it's sort of galvanized um, businesses and policymakers and individuals to start thinking about the really big challenges that we know we need to. Uh, we know we need to address. We can't afford not to address. So that's very refreshing um, to see that taking place, even though, as you mentioned, we know uh, it's going to be a really challenging time uh, for some period of time as we sort of businesses reorient. There's been so much damage and shock to the global economy and individual lives that it's going to take some time to work through this for sure. Um, let me switch gears just for, just for a minute and talk about a subject that's near and dear to, uh, to my heart, which is uh, investment investor engagement. Um, companies, it's been my observation, companies that uh, that are good about engaging with their investors tend to be the same companies that are good about engaging with their other stakeholders, be they you know, consumers, their employees, uh, and, and so there's sort of a, a correlation between those activities, and that's why we're always anxious as investors to uh, to find companies that we can engage with, with respect to sustainability, really think about uh, more resilient business models, and that's a good partnership uh, from our perspective. Uh, and we're always anxious to get more engagement going on uh, from companies that are out there. And I'd like to hear um, from each of you on how you think uh, that, that trend is evolving. Um, do you see things changing? I mean, we see some of the numbers where you know comp many companies are now reporting uh, metrics on the sustainability topics relevant to them in a more standardized way, but then there's still some that aren't, and there's still some that aren't uh, making it very easy for us as investors uh, to really understand the risks and opportunities uh, with respect to sustainability. So how do you see that evolving uh, in, this, in this COVID era? Who are you asking, Scott? <laughs> Well, let's see, it could be anybody that wants to start. Maybe ask Maria to start. Uh, well, I think um, during the, the, the COVID crisis and also after, it's going to be necessary uh, a fluently dialogue and a clear communication, not only with the investors or the investors and, and, and the company, between all of them, also with the employees, as you said, Scott. And, and for example, in, in our case in Spain, and I think in the rest of the of the countries, I suppose that it happened the same. Uh, there was a, a conversation, a, a deep conversation with the organization, the public organizations, about how we are going to deal with the crisis, not only during this month that maybe some economies will stop, but also in the future. And I think uh, we have to to do this opportunity uh, as something that is going to be a big, responsible and sustainable uh, finance uh, to participate in, in this kind of projects. And, and as I said before, it's going to be our opportunity to be active and to be critically in the development of projects. Uh, I think we are going to do focus in the projects that we have to do. Uh, of course, uh, like they say before about the the social, not, not only environmental issues, also with the social one. In our case, for example, we, we have find we have found uh, that it's very important to the projects like waste recycling, the water and energy supply, uh, and also uh, projects like the maintenance of the construction of hospitals, universities, laboratories, and, and the investment they are going to put the money in this kind of, of projects. Uh, the COVID has demonstrated human vulner vulnerability and as well as the need to work and comply with the 70s SDGs. I think everybody is convinced about this. And I think it's going to be our opportunity to, to show everyone that this is something very important to everyone. I think we, we have suffered, suffered consequence, uh, maybe not to be so attending in this kind of, of goals. Uh, it's true that there are more than $3.6 trillion in global infrastructure market uh, available from investment funds to invest in this kind of things that I have mentioned, that energy infrastructure and sustainability. So I think we are so responsible to, to check and, and to choose this kind of project. So the dialogue 
between and, and we have also to, to invest with the public organization and, and we have to do something between we have to make a, a joint venture the investment and, and also the companies to to work together and to to get our goals thanks maria alessandra maybe you, you can share your comments for uh, how, how do you see uh, the dialogue really developing between um, investors uh, and, and companies? Uh, we, I, I can tell you, you know, our investors is sort of an exponential increase in terms of their focus and questioning on sustainability issues. So, uh, you know, we're always asking for more, but will we see, will we see things uh, perhaps move more quickly um, after this crisis? Yeah, first of all, apologies, I lost connection for a few minutes. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the dialogue has been constant and very constructive, if anything, much more intense than in normal circumstances with uh, weekly calls with investors looking for updates. And, and the focus was indeed on environmental and sustainability, but also on social. I think there was a growing focus on the S under the SDG, which has never been there before. I think we've got questions being in energy, around uh, environment and climate change and all of that was already part of the dialogue although it clearly uh, increased significantly during COVID but the focus on on s what are we doing for, uh, for under the social part of our strategy how we are contributing to the communities in which we operate what are we doing for our employees are we changing our welfare approach all of these things were important I think the investors we are keen to understand concretely the action that we were doing also in terms of supporting non-profit organization or the healthcare Italian system, which is what we have been doing during the peak of the crisis. Um, and then more lately, they've been focusing on, on again, on the E for, SD, for the ESG and what are we doing to push and promote uh, an environmental and sustainability uh, under the climate change perspective agenda and, and how we are contributing with our skill set in that uh, in that respect and therefore how we are going to be part of the European New Green Deal and in that context uh, I think one of the topics that has been uh, very much uh, uh, part of our constant dialogue is the uh, the role that players like us can have in energy transition how can we accelerate uh, a more broad and deep contribution in doing what each of us can do in its respective uh, uh, sectors. And in this context, uh, one element which is coming out as a very topical uh, point for any call we have with investors is hydrogen and the role that green hydrogen can have uh, for any 2050 decarbonization agenda in any sector. And I think this is something that wasn't there with this consistency before. It was there maybe in our space, but it wasn't so broadly uh, touch whether you talk about transportation or petrochemicals or heavy industries, aluminium, steels, maritime, every single sector or, is now looking at green fuel and biofuel and more sustainable ways to carry out their activities. And, and this is something that probably would have not been there without COVID with the same intensity that we are seeing today. Yeah, it certainly feels like that. It's, um, I guess, things that maybe people thought were too far away, and so they weren't you know, really front and center in front of different companies. Um, you know, in thinking about the opportunities, not just the risks of some of these challenges, but thinking about the opportunities for businesses uh, to develop their business and do it in a sustainable way. It's sort of the, you know, the window's been opened as people start to think about the possibilities um, that will accompany some of these, uh, you know, pretty. Uh, pretty aggressive fiscal spending plans that are being developed. And undoubtedly, we're going to see a lot more of those, I would say, for the next several years. So it's very exciting to see that. Uh, Fiona, Fiona, do you have some comments about uh, how you think things will evolve between yeah. uh, investors and companies? Yes, so I think um, investors have been really uh, engaged and engaging with companies on a far more regular basis. So at the uh, beginning of April, practically, you know, just yeah, well in the UK anyway, when the, not long after the lockdown happened, we put out a guide for our signatory base about what actions they should be taking with companies. So it was all around that engagement. And we said to, first of all, to um, investors that you really need to give companies the space that they need to deal with the crisis. It's happening now and they've got a lot on their plate. 
but you did need to engage with the companies that you felt were falling behind in their crisis management or engage with um, companies where you felt that harm was being hidden behind or worsened by the crisis. That really investors needed to reprioritise some of their engagement topic, that not everything was going to be the top of the agenda for um, companies at the moment. So, and, then, and we expected also that investors and companies wanted them to publicly support an economy-wide response. We've all also, you know, encouraged investors to participate in virtual AGMs, and not all of our signatories have wanted to do that. They don't particularly like AG, um, virtual AGMs. Some of them, they feel that it, they don't get a good enough voice, but this is the situation we're in. So participate and let's support them. We also said in our seven point action plan that, uh, you know, we should be receptive as investors to requests for financial support or for other expertise, but again, to really maintain a long-term focus in investment decision making. That's been a key message. And then uh, a few weeks after that, coming into the AGM season in some parts of the world, we developed specific guidance questions for investors around ESG related questions. And I've put both of these on Nic Nic Nicola, Nico has in the chat if you want to have a look at them, the links are there. So the specific questions were really around business continuity. So for uh, employers, suppliers and communities, then a whole lot of questions around employee health and well-being to ensure that the workforce was being looked after as well as they could be. And then that there was, we had questions around alignment with the long-term value creation. So lots of discussions around the social issues has been, as has been said, and they've really come to the fore while also thinking about climate issues as, as well. So that's what we've been doing and we've been seeing that our signatories have been very engaged with the, uh, with the business community and that that engagement is continuing to happen on a very regular basis. But when I've spoken to uh, our signatories and we've had a number of webinars and conference calls and things about these issues, in the main, I think that they've been happy with the responses that they're getting back from companies and feeling that they want to continue to support and provide additional capital where required to good long-term sustainable businesses. And equally, we're seeing at the moment, uh, reading all of the different reports that are coming out, that it's ESG funds and company, companies who have embedded environmental, social and governance factors well into what they're doing and investment products that are embedded them well, that are doing the best throughout this crisis, which isn't really surprising. Yeah, thank you. I, I've been, um, you know, sort of in awe at how well uh, received some of the, the, the social bonds and sustainability bonds uh, have been in the financial marketplace. I mean, it's definitely clear to me that there is a, a high degree of willingness uh, for large institutional investors to better align their portfolios uh, with respect to addressing some of these, uh, these investment needs and, and opportunities. Um, so that is, is really great to see. And I, it's come up a few times here uh, from, from each one of us, I think, thinking about uh, how the view with respect to social sustainability issues has been transformed by this crisis. Um, as, you, as you said, I think, Fiona, it used to be maybe the, the more difficult area for investors to think about and maybe the more difficult uh, area for companies to talk about. But uh, so much at least from my perspective, so much about this crisis. It's, it's highlighted uh, how important uh, making those investments are for companies to be successful. Um, and it's shown, it's shown up in the resilience of the business model through this type of, of, of crisis. Um, but it also, uh, it also is, a, is sort of a, a mark, I think, of, of, of management quality uh, for many businesses. And so we've always kind of thought about that, uh, how businesses uh, describe their uh, risks and opportunities with respect to sustainability as as really a, a mark of, of, of management quality. And I think a lot of ac academic studies, as more and more data accumulates, demonstrate that that is the case. And those companies that focus on sustainability tend to be much more resilient when a crisis happens. And of course, we're in 
the sort of uh, environment where, where, we, where we realize that can happen uh, much more quickly uh, than we maybe ever thought possible. So really important to focus on those uh, aspects of resiliency. Um, maybe I, I'll offer to you know, see if you can comment on, particularly on the social uh, sustainability issues in terms of what uh, you know, your individual companies are going to change, uh, what you think that your industry should be doing to change with respect to uh, some of the social challenges that maybe you have within your business model, but also how we as uh, leaders in the business community uh, can help uh, bridge the gap here that, that has is sort of glaringly opened up. Once we look outside of our own businesses, we see that you know, access to the digital economy, access to healthcare, all these things, it really, it's a large divide that's opened up. But maybe I'd like to seek your comments in, in, in terms of thinking about what we can do within our uh, industries, but uh, also more broadly. Maybe I'll turn it uh, back over to you, uh, Maria. Okay. Uh, well, uh, to help to the social uh, issues of the social goals, of course, it's a, a question that I want to think, I, I hope that my company is going to help in this, uh, in this matter. Uh, because it's true that the impact of, the, of this crisis changed all the macroeconomic, macroeconomic forecasts of the construction sector, not only in Spain, also in Europe and in the rest of the world. But it's, it's, the, it's, it's true that maybe we have to think in the construction sector with a double and new perspective in, I, I mean, our infrastructures, our projects will be a growth it's going to be a growth and a recovery engine for the countries after the COVID, because uh, we we could do uh, new employees. Uh, we are a main economic uh, activity, so that generate wealth in in the world. And also, in, in the other hand, we are going to to do and to choose projects that I'm sure that we are going to meet social and environmental needs in a responsible way and commit to meeting uh, the, the SDGs. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we are trying to focus our new projects, uh, looking for these uh, goals. And we are trying to do things like uh, projects specific in waste recycling, the water supply and infrastructure that they are going to help and to get this, this social uh, goal. I think for example, uh, during the pandemic, uh, it's for this reason that some countries like, I don't know, maybe Germany, the United Kingdom, I, I think uh, Poland, the, the construction activity have considered the sector as essential, uh, and the, which is why its activity has never stopped. Uh, I think it's a reason because uh, it's true if you if you think in your in your countries in your in the market that your companies is working uh, right now, I'm sure that there are two or three sectors uh, very important in its country. But I'm sure that in these three top, the construction is one of them. But the reason is not because we are a huge sector or because we are so important. It's because we need a lot of people working, and it's. Uh, Something that now, uh, not only with the health crisis, is joining with the economic crisis. I think it's something that we have to make focus and we have to push uh, these countries to invest in this kind of projects and they are going to get uh, new employees and maybe it's going to be easier to reach uh, the goals, not only the SDGs, also the, 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 the economics of the, of the governments and the countries. Uh, from FCC, we use a sustainable financing system uh, since the objective of supporting economic, social, and environmental growth through infrastructure development. We support this strategy in two ways. Uh, we, we look for the necessary financing for the development of the projects, and as I mentioned before, uh, we are trying to do public and private collaboration. We, we try to, to help the government and, and to get their their projects. And we design a control system, an IT control system, uh, when we are looking for a transparency, not only for the client, also to the subcontractors, the employees, the partners. Uh, we are trying to be transparent in the information and the going of the project. 
I think this stakeholders information is essential and it's a very good point also to the SDGs because we are going to teach, uh, we are going to show what are we doing, how and where we are wasting or investment the money. So I think uh, this is uh, the, the way that we are trying to draw and we are trying to, to show to the, all the stakeholders that we are working around, uh, partners, clients, employees, and also, uh, of course, our, uh, I know, everybody I think in, in the company is, uh, is following these uh, this issues. Uh, Alessandra, maybe uh, you can offer your comments and thoughts about, uh, particularly with respect to uh, the, the the new focus on uh, social and yep. uh, the aspects of that for, uh, particularly for from the investor's perspective, both maybe the activities that you're doing, uh, investing in your business, but also those who are investing in your company. Yeah, I think this the as I said before, the S is is gaining share within the ESG. Uh, overall weighting uh, also from investors, which I think is very good. I mean, let's try to distinguish how we address the S in what we do. First, uh, we, we focus and we've been focusing a lot on the health and safety of our employees during the peak of the pandemic, and more lately on the implication of uh, different ways of looking at welfare and their well-being and work-life balance. I mean, we all took the, we had to, to work from home but now we are all thinking how norm, what the new norm will be and how this will impact the, the, the lives of our uh, of our employees and we are thinking through the best approach to balance this in in, in their perspective um, and on on the still on the S side we we are increasing the focus which already was there of reducing the impact of the activities we do we are an infrastructure company on the communities where we operate. We have uh, every year between 800 and 900 work sites in Italy, which means that uh, it's very hard not to have a work site uh, of our own across the country. And in every of this work site, the focus is uh, try to leverage on local content and employees. So uh, affecting more than 95% of our supply chain is Italian based, uh, making sure that they grow with us on one side. But at the same time, during the pandemic, we were uh, very focused on make sure that the, their, the the health of our suppliers was as focused and, and taken care of as of our employees. Um, and this this support is now continuing more trying to stay close to them in terms of uh, payment terms and other instruments that can help them navigate uh, the way uh, the crisis that hit a number of us. But at the same time, working every time, trying to reduce the overall physical impact on the on the land and the territories in which we operate and increase the focus on uh, remediation work after all of this uh, construction uh, activities has been carried out. So there are a lot of things that are ongoing in everything we do, uh, which are, are as always have always been very important, but are going to be even more important. And I think the plus of what has happened is that investors are increasingly focused on this and so it's something that is a well thought and well spent time uh, not, not only money another thing that we've been doing is we've launched uh, a few years ago a foundation which is dedicated uh, to uh, non-profit initiatives which clearly has been very active uh, during the pandemic with a number of initiatives supporting uh, bringing foods uh, and 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 immediate needs uh, to those that couldn't uh, um, help themselves, as well as hospitals and another of other a number of other organizations, and and also provide to to some of these organizations. Um, so there are a number of things that we are doing on on the S, and I think that still I want to go back to to something that I was uh, commenting before because I think one of the greater contribution we can give to uh, having learned through the crisis is uh, is really make sure that we push and promote uh, innovation in in reducing the carbon footprint in what we do in every activities uh, that we carry out. Uh, one of the activities where we are very focused in within our energy transition agenda is uh, uh, energy efficiency. Um, and, and the fact that we have not stopped and the focus has actually increased was uh, confirmed by the fact that uh, la only last week we announced the acquisition of two companies, one of which is very focused on um, 
carrying out works and activities and energy efficiency for healthcare infrastructures, so hospitals and, and elderly care um, um, infrastructures. And clearly this is an area where there is going to be a growing focus, growing amount of investments and where reducing the carbon footprint and the or energy consumption, whatever you want to look at the same um, equation, is going to be important for, for our, our future. So each of us, um, regardless of the sector in which we operate, we can give a strong contribution uh, to this type of effort. And I think, I really believe that investors are, are increasingly speaking our same language. I still believe that there is uh, an element of lack of consistency in which KPI to look at uh, what is more or less important to focus on, how do you measure all of this in a consistent manner. And so this is a journey that uh, we all need to uh, do together, investors and corporates yeah. and different stakeholders, but uh, in a way COVID has allowed us to, to have an, a unique opportunity to emphasize more what each of us can do under uh, all of the, the relevant SDGs uh, principle. Thank you. Um, and Fiona, before I ask you your comments on whether the S is here to stay and maybe about uh, any specific work that might be going on at the PRI with respect to that, um, I just want to see if our friends from uh, Enel were able to join. I know there were some technical difficulties. Um, and then maybe uh, I'll give it a pause here and see if anybody pops up. Okay. Don't, don't, don't see anybody joining, so... Um, Marie, after a few other comments, maybe you want to come, come in with the, uh, some, some final thoughts and, uh, and uh, we're coming, coming up on the hour here, so maybe we have about another 10 minutes or so. Fiona, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so on the S issues, I, like I said, I've said throughout, I've been really, really delighted to see the S issues rise because this is something I've tried to push for within our signatory base since I've been at the PRI. And while we've had a cohort of our signatories who have always been interested in the S issues, it hasn't been as widespread as I would have liked. And I really hope that it's here to stay. I think that, you know, for anyone who's sort of in doubt about the sustainability in agenda, whether it's in the business community or the investment community, I think, you know, COVID-19 is the clearest example that you can find that without healthy people, without a healthy planet, you are not going to have a healthy economy. They are completely interconnected. I think that is really uh, dawning on people. And this has been talked about, but, you know, I really feel that with seeing the death knell on Freeman economic theory, that there's much more of a move from to the stakeholder capitalism um, that really encompasses shareholders, employees, communities, customers and suppliers. And I think that we aren't going back to just thinking about the role of a company is to only create and generate profits for its shareholders, or that the role of an investor is only to provide returns, that we have to think about things in a much more connected way. And this is where I think that the sustainable development goals have never been any more important than they are today. To me, they're like a plan, a business plan for what we need to do for the recovery. And if we use them as our North Star, it really shows us all of the issues that we need to focus on to make sure that we do have a world that we build back better in. I think that also we've seen from our perspective that something that I've already, I've always known and many investors know, that COVID-19 I think has really demonstrated the need in for us to see labour force reforms where we don't see strong protection for workers, where we're not seeing living wages, where we're not seeing good labour rights. Uh, as well on the social issue, I think that where we're talking about the recovery Obviously, governments are keen, are going to have to create jobs. And we also need to ensure that we're, that we're having a recovery that aids the transition to a low carbon economy. And we need to link those things together. 
So we need to ensure that the recovery creates jobs, that they are green jobs, but they're, they're good jobs and they're jobs with the right social protections in place. And I think that that is going to be crucial. So we launched for investors today a new guide on the SDGs that's focusing on outcomes. So not just thinking about sustainability on a you know, risk return matrix, but thinking about sustainability and thinking about the SDGs in terms of risk return and outcomes. So what is the outcome that the investments that you make, what do they have in the real world? And how do you measure those? And this is where we're really trying to move the sustainability discussion to, moving it beyond just thinking about risk return and into a much broader sphere that the SDGs are an important part of. I always say from the investment point of view, because um, I've worked in the pension sector and with pension funds all of my life, that it, there is no good in me putting my money into a pension fund and that pension fund just providing a return for me while at the same time destroying the world that I want to retire into and not thinking about the consequences for the environment or for all four people about the way that we invest. And I really do think that this is coming together it already was, but COVID-19, if you know, you, you mentioned in the beginning, don't waste a good crisis. And that's what we've got, we've got to not do. That's what I'm determined we don't do. And that all of these things now finally come together in a much more meaningful way. No, thank you for those comments. Couldn't agree more. And I, um, you know, I, I guess when I run into occasional uh, skeptics who sometimes want to put um, sustainability issues at odds with growth and well-being, I just usually say, well, you've got it all wrong. I mean, sustainability is all about making the economic pie bigger, more inclusive, more resilient. Um, and so that's what we're all thinking about. And it's about thinking more longer term uh, instead of just thinking about what is optimal for the short term. And uh, it's, it's exciting to see that dialogue really getting new energy, uh, partially because of this crisis where so many different stakeholders uh, of companies, be they customers, employees, investors, are all thinking uh, about sustainability as being a more urgent need, an urgent focus. And uh, so, you know, I really think, you know, we, we uh, definitely need to make sure all of us involved uh, as leaders that uh, we don't let this crisis go to waste. Um, there's an opportunity here to hit the reset button in many different areas to reprioritize and to be more focused on uh, sus sustainable business models and really looking at, at not just the risks, but all the opportunities that are there uh, for businesses to address. And um, there, I, I just want to you know, highlight that the chief financial officers, CFOs, are really uh, at the center of this activity in their organizations. And that's why uh, we started uh, the CFO ta uh, task force was to really uh, try to get more CFOs uh, directly learning from one another, uh, involved in shaping uh, useful tools uh, that can be of help to, uh, to every company uh, on this journey. And so I would, I would uh, call out now and just say, you know, anybody who's interested uh, in joining our CFO task force, please um, you know, contact uh, Marie or anybody at the UN Global Compact and, and they can tell you how to be involved. Um, so with that, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. I want to turn it over to Marie now and see if she has some additional closing comments. While we're waiting for Marie Scott, can I give a shout out on a couple of good, um, a couple of good tools from the investment side, talking about the issues that we that we were on social issues. So Just Capital has got some great tools that are there. So is the Business and Human Rights um, uh, Resource Centre have put out, so, you know, if, if investors are really looking to think about these issues in a more detailed way, they're a great way to start. Yeah, thank you. That's great, uh, Fiona. I see uh, lots of comments scrolling by. Thanks, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, apologies, I had to kind of be in the background. We were trying to bring in Alberto, but unfortunately, uh, he was not able to join us. But uh, I'm sure there'll be many other opportunities to to bring him uh, to the table. I wanted to sort of thank everyone, and especially you know Scott for moderating the session. There were many different questions also going through the um, the, the wall, so we will capture those and uh, and follow up. But uh, it's just great to have a 
uh, you know, a, a sort of strong uh, women, uh, sort of, you know, uh, empowered sort of CFOs as well. Uh, and, and Fiona, uh, thank you so much for, for your lead on this. Um, so we will follow up if you, um, you know, so if, if you joined us from, from that uh, area as in finance sort of uh, sector, please link us sort of reach out to us. There's are, there are many opportunities for, for you to join the task force and, and the working groups as well. We're looking at growing, uh, you know, the the task force in, with, with leading companies in, in this space. And um, it's a very hands-on group. You know, uh, we meet on a, on a regular basis and uh, we're really kind of, you know, working closely with investors because we feel it's it's going to be the way forward. So, uh, you know, thank you very much to, to all of you for joining. Apologies again for the uh, slight sort of uh, technical issues that we experienced. Uh, but, you know, this is a uh, groundbreaking in, in, uh, in that sense. You know, we've never actually done that before. So, um, you know, hopefully the next the next one will be even better. But uh, thank you for your interaction as well and for those who've, who've joined. And um, thank you, Alessandra, Maria, Fiona and Scott. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you.